Today, I'm taking you to try a new boat, the Oceanus 34.1, Beneteau's latest model, introduced in 2022. Follow me. We left this morning from Marina Cala de Sarde, the greenest marina in Italy. We'll show you some pictures shortly, which it is also a Beneteau boat testing center run by NSS Yachting. NSS has two testing centers, one here at Marina Cala de Sarde in Sardinia and another in Tuscany at Marina Cala de Medici. From Cala de Sarde, we came to the Madalena Archipelago. After two hours sailing, we arrived at this beautiful place. We're here to try out this boat, the Oceanus 34.1, Beneteau's latest model, which came out in 2022. We'll show you the exterior, the interior, and explain in detail how the boat is made. Then we're going to test it under sail. Follow me. Let's get to know her. Oceanus 34.1, Beneteau's 2022 model. It's part of the new generation of models from the shipyard, a generation that was born in 2017 with the Oceanus 51.1, which introduced a major innovation in sailboats, the bow chine. The chine on the hull was already there. It started from the stern and stopped here, halfway up the boat. With the Oceanus 51.1, the chine continues its course and goes all the way to the end of the bow. Since the 51.1, all the models in this range have it, but also many of the boats in other ranges. We've said it many times, the chine at the hull at the bow increases the volume of the forward area a lot because with the chine in the lower part of the boat, the floor gets wider. This creates more volume in the bow and also here in the salon. The Oceanus 34.1 has a hull length of 9.99 meters. So in Italy, it's classified as a natante, which simplifies the bureaucracy. The boat replaces the Oceanus 35.1. And in the comparison, we see how Beneteau has completely changed its vision of the sailboat. The Oceanus 35.1 was a comfort-oriented boat, whereas this one is more performance-oriented. The Oceanus 34.1 is still a comfortable boat because otherwise it wouldn't be sold, but it's a comfortable boat that travels very well under sail. Let's look at two details. The Oceanus 35.1 had an arch on top of the deck house. Because of the arch, the boom had to be raised to the site, which made it necessary to have a mainsail furler. Because working on a mainsail with a boom that high is really very tiring. So with the high boom, the 35.1 had a small 25.5 square meter mainsail, whereas the new boat has a much lower boom, and as you can see is much easier to work on, and also has a 31.5 square meter mainsail, about 20% more. So much more sail area, and we're only talking about the standard sail plan. The other thing that the older Oceanus 35.1 had was a wider beam. That model had a maximum beam of 3.72 meters, 12.2 feet, when in contrast, the maximum beam of this boat is 3.57 meters, 11.71 feet, definitely narrower. Narrower by 15 centimeters, 0.49 feet. Mark Lombard, who is the designer of the boat, the man who drew the water lines, while the interior was designed by Nantes Design of Milan, Mark Lombard, I said, decided to contain the beam probably to help performance. However, even if small, it remains the largest beam in its category, under 33 feet. Let's now look at the boat point by point, starting from the bow to the end of the stern. At the bow, the first thing we notice is the triangle. The bow triangle is really very wide, very spacious, considering we are on a 9.99 meters, 33 feet. The other thing is the anchor chain locker, a very large locker, but with a small problem. The board that should be at an angle to get the chain down the shaft is not very slanted. It's a little flat. 
Why is this? Because if it was very slanted, it would take away room from the forward cabin position just below. So they had to find a compromise. As we know, a boat is always about finding the right compromise. What happens is that in some situations, when we pull up the chain, it can pile up and not slide down. So you have to give it some help. Anyway, because the locker is really very large, it's difficult for the chain to pile up to the point of interfering with the power windlass. A second problem is here, the anchor roller. The anchor roller, as you can see, is not parallel to the boat. It's asymmetrical, going to the left. When there is a lot of wind, the chain will face to the left while the boat will face straight, preventing it from functioning perfectly, because the roller will be pulled sideways. So it'll be stressed, but it is an easily solved problem. One line on this cleat, one line on the other cleat, and two lines go to the link of the chain. Once they're in place, you drop the chain down five feet, chain goes loose, and all the force goes to the two lines. You have two advantages, the chain pulling in the direction of the boat, and you relieve the strain on the electric windlass, ensuring its longer life. Here we have the deck house. The deck house is quite large, with plenty of room for lounging. Now let's see what I can find midship. In the boats, the shrouds are just left of the mast. But here they're shifted much further back. The reason is Mark Lombardi decided not to use a backstay. As you can see, the stern has no stays, which makes accessing the aft platform a breeze. But the mast, of course, had to be supported. So what did he do? He angled the spreaders back a lot and moved the shrouds further back. These shrouds now support the mast, both sideways and from the back, so they basically serve as backstays. Let's focus now on the boom. Did you notice the boom is very low? And this is very important, because with a low boom I can easily work on the mainsail something I can't do with a high boom, so a big plus point for the boat. Let's go on and see what they've done with the cockpit. As we mentioned earlier, the side decks are wide, making it easy to get back to the cockpit. A really large cockpit dominated by this table. When you open the table, it can comfortably seat six people, three on one side and three on the other one. Clever cup holders. Under the port bench, there's a fairly large locker. But there's no locker under the starboard bench, because they wanted to have a higher ceiling in the cabin underneath. That instead is where the third cabin is located. In the two-cabin version, this locker goes instead all the way down and is really huge. Allow me to point out something that I find very clever. Normally, until a few years ago, these portholes were mounted up here, which is the right place to provide airflow. Then, for aesthetic reasons, they migrated to this position. But in this position, when the airflow comes, the air passes over and doesn't enter the porthole, especially if the opening is in this direction. The airflow does just that. It goes up and doesn't enter the porthole. Then, very cleverly, not a design simply turned it around, making so it faces like this. The airflow hits on the door, enters and circulates into the aft cabin, providing fresh air that is essential in the summer when it's very hot. Now let's move to the stern. At the stern, first thing we see is this helmsman's seat going up. I raise this part, I raise that part. It opens up the whole stern, which is now in communication with the bathing platform which is very large, well finished and also solid. But precisely because it's solid, it's heavy. In this manual version, when I have to lift it up to open it, it's a bit of a struggle. Another thing I really like was the location of the self-inflating raft. The self-inflating raft is often found inside the lockers. And to me, that seems like nonsense. Because have you seen how big it is? It weighs 35, 40 kilograms. Taking it out there, lifting it, and then taking it into the water is a very heavy job. Not everyone can do it. Whereas in that position, you don't need to lift it, you drag it. You drag it onto the swimming platform and throw it into the water, that's it. Next to the space that holds the self-inflating raft are these two hatches, one and two, which give access to the stern locker, a very large locker, but one that should be used with caution because all the elements of the wheelhouse are inside. So if we put objects, especially large objects in bulk, we run the risk that will interfere with the proper functioning of the wheelhouse. 
Now let's go and see what's below deck. The Oceanus 34.1 is offered in two versions. This is the three-cabin version. Let me remind you that this is an NSS charter boat. So it's a boat that's part of the charter fleet in the summer, and in the winter, it's one of the models that you can try out at one of their two test centers. So this is a three-cabin, two aft cabins, one forward cabin, and one bathroom. The other version is the two-cabin, which perhaps is the one that sold the most to private individuals because it has a four-cabin, as we'll see, which is very nice. And this very large aft cabin and bathroom, the bathroom, which in this three-cabin version has no shower at all, and in the two-cabin version instead steals some of that space from the cabin and gets the shower stall, which is important because it provides a nice extra convenience. Another important and very well-researched point is the kitchen. As you can see, it's a pretty big galley, an L-shaped galley, a galley for navigating, with this edge that's there to keep things from falling off. But it's also there to hold on tight when we're below deck. The kitchen is a two-burner with a tilting oven, countertop, large refrigerator, sink, but most of all, a very convenient thing in this cabinetry. Closets on top, cabinets underneath, shelves, it's important to have such a well-designed kitchen because we have everything we need for cooking at our fingertips. It's a kitchen where one prepares meals to be served on the center table, which with the sides open becomes a very large table and can easily seat six, even seven people. The couches are a bus style, one opposite the other. They're large so they can become two emergency bunks if needed. And I've got the chart table. A tiny little fold-away table with lots of emptying pockets. A countertop under the table. The last part to visit is the bow, the large bow. Keep in mind that we're on a 33-foot boat. But although the boat isn't so long, the cabin is very large. It's really a nice cabin with a very deep V-bed. A nice closet hidden behind one of the doors and shelves where we can store our things. And with that, we've seen everything in the interior. The finishes, as you can see, are good finishes. Now we go out to try the boat, to draw conclusions from everything we've seen so far. Let's go try the boat. Simona was very kind. You can leave it to me now. Thank you, Simona. While we were checking out the interior, she prepared the boat rigged the sails and started sailing. The first thing I want to point out is this. Look, here. You'll notice that the rudder is steady. The boat is going straight. What does this mean? That the boat is well balanced. The sails are also well regulated, thanks to Simona. But also that the boat has good balance, so I don't have to correct it all the time. This balance avoids opening the rudder blade all the time, thus slowing down the boat. But it also means that the autopilot will work very little, so it will drain the batteries much less. So this is a very good thing about the boat. Let's talk about the sail plan. The boat right now has a 17 square meter self-tacking jib and a 31 and a half square meter semi-battened mainsail. Not a particularly large sail plan, but more than enough to sail fairly well. How much real wind do we have right now? We've got seven knots and we're doing 4.2, so the boat's doing very well, especially for a cruising boat with a self-tacking jib. But if you want more performance from this boat, you have to go for the sail plan called First Line, a name that echoes that of the first range, Beneteau's highest performance boat range. That sail plan has about 40% more sail, 39% more canvas to be exact, so a lot of stuff and the boat clearly behaves differently. Yesterday morning, we also tried this boat with a parasailer. In the transfer that took us from Cala de Sardi to the Madalena Archipelago, where we are now, it took us a couple of hours to get to H343, and we did it with a parasailer. So we tried it before arriving here. I wanted to try it because I think it's a sail that's particularly good for boats like this one, and especially for doing long distances because, as you can see, it does not carry mainsail. There's only this parasailer. The sail is extremely stable. We did all the sailing on autopilot, 
without needing someone on the helm, as is the case instead with Jenniker A or Spinnaker. The parasailer is built so as to pull up the bow slightly, and this helps prevent the boat from broaching or bear away inadvertently. So an interesting sail. And with this sail with 8.8 .8 knots of wind, we're doing 5.7, so quite a lot for these conditions in boat. As I told you before, the boom is low, so it's a boom that you can't maneuver easily. The self-tacking jib, the advice is, if you have to buy this boat, get the self-tacking, because it's certainly very convenient. If you're on board with the family and you're the only one who knows how to carry the boat, the self-tacking changes your life. Don't give up taking the Genoa rails, though. As for Genoa, this one mounts a 105% Genoa. Our advice is, don't get it from the yard dealer. Get a good sail maker to make it. Consider that having good sails is like putting a more powerful engine on the boat. The boat changes from okay to excellent. So my advice, get a nice 105% Genoa made. And just in case, get a Code Zero or a Parasailer. I think I've told you everything about the boat. One reminder, this is a video from the SVN Onboard series. This is not a sea trial, this is a presentation of the boat. If you want to read the sea trial instead, you need to go to the link found in the description window below the video. From that link, download the actual sea trial with all our more technical observations. Thanks to Simona Pasqua. Thank you, Simona, for helping us to manage the boat. I wish to thank the NSS group for giving us the boat and also providing that catamaran over there, which serves as a support boat and accommodation. Before we finish, I'd like to remind you that on our YouTube channel, the subscriber section is open. Go and visit it. It's a very interesting section where we publish some videos that will be on free viewing, only offering them to subscribers a few months earlier. Other videos, however, are designed and offered exclusively to our subscribers. And they're the ones that are a little bit more technical. So go and see if there's any video that you might be interested in and subscribe if you want. With that in mind, I say goodbye. I'll see you on the next video of svnsolovela.net.